At number 10, some background. The Mughal dynasty in India was founded by Babur, a descendant of the one, the only, Genghis Khan and Tamerlane. After he defeated a sultan of Delhi named Ibrahim Lodi in 1526, Babur was the first step in the Mughal dynasty that would last for over three centuries. To say that the empire was immense is an understatement. The empire ruled over 103 million people, probably even more. The Mughals were rooted in Muslim beliefs and were noted for their well organized government and cultural sophistication. Many of the rulers tried to integrate the Hindus and Muslims under one state, but as we will find out from this list, it was not an easy thing to do, which ended up causing a lot of strife. Many rulers of the empire flip flopped back and forth between being merciful and tyrannical towards the Hindus, adding to centuries of oppression. At number 9, Blinded. Humayun was set to inherit the throne from his father, much to the jealousy of his brothers. He was 23 when he ascended the throne in 1530 after the death of his father. His brothers reigned over different fiefs, but none of them were satisfied unless they had the crown. He also wasn't the best ruler. Humayun was sent into exile for 15 years after he was overthrown by one of his father's generals, Sher Shah. Humayun fled and eventually ended up in Persia where he built back up an army through his partnership with the Shah. Slowly, he took back his land, facing his own brothers who were constantly scheming against him. But Babur, his father, made him promise that he would never lay a hand on his brothers. But his brother Kamran continued to threaten him, and one instance while defending a fort turned on the innocents trapped inside and took their lives viciously. Kamran, not a good dude. Something needed to be done. He eventually catches his scheming brothers, blinds his brother Cameron, and chains his brother Askari. A little messed up, but like, you know, not bad for war. Before I carry on with the rest of the video, make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel and maybe consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far. At number 8, Akbar. Humayun continued to deal with the competition of his brothers until finally his reign came to an end, but not in the way that you would expect. He was carrying a bunch of books up some stairs and he accidentally fell, leading to a lethal head injury. His 13 year old son Akbar had to inherit the throne. Akbar would later become known as the Great, but that doesn't mean that he didn't do some questionable things. Where his father failed to conquer, Akbar swept through. But just like his father, he encountered jealousy and dangerous ambition in the dark corners of his reign. In Delhi, an attempt to assassinate him was made, the bowman nearly missing him. Who was behind it? The slave of a nobleman who recently tried to start a rebellion. But the plot thickens. Akbar's foster brother's mother had further designs to establish power for herself through her son, Adam Khan. Khan actually ended up taking the life of Akbar's foster father, which led to Akbar throwing him down the stairs and therefore killing him. The mother died 40 days later due to grief. Grief over her son or the loss of power? Who knows? At number 7, Jahangir. So this guy was super impatient to become the ruler and was getting tired of daddy Akbar taking his time. So he revolted. Damn, this court honestly was just rife with rebellion. They never got tired of it. In 1599, while his father was otherwise engaged and away from the palace, Prince Salim led a revolt. During the revolt, he even skinned a man alive. Akbar was pissed about this and wrote to his son and said, quote, I have never skinned a bird alive in my life and you have treated a human being in this manner. Jahangir then went on to conspire against a close advisor of his father named Abul Fazl, whom Jahangir killed in a small battle. Despite Akbar being devastated at his son's behavior, he was the only male heir left to inherit. So on Akbar's deathbed, he forgave his son and implored the nobles to recognize him as a leader. At number 6, so to an ox. Now Jahangir was emperor, but the trouble didn't stop there. I saw some sources recognize him as a somewhat benevolent figure, while others said that he was the exact opposite. He was pretty brutal, and his first task was crushing a rebellion against that which his own son began. Apple, not far from the tree. He was traveling to Lahore when he came across two nobles who were sympathetic to his son's cause. So he decided to punish them in a very peculiar and violent way. He ordered that one be sewed to the skin of an ass and the other to an ox. Now that is messed up. When he got to Lahore to face the rebels, he crushed them and blinded his own son as punishment. A ruler couldn't have any impediments, so therefore his son could no longer pursue the role. Then he hung his son's followers outside of Taksa 
Valley Gate. Yeah, so even within the confines of war, this guy had some pretty messed up ideas. At number 5, the horse and his boy. On the less violent end of the spectrum, Jahangir was actually a big fan of the arts, science, and worldly things. Unlike his father who couldn't read and write, an interesting skill for a ruler not to have, Jahangir was all about it. He really wasn't interested in military, which was a task he left to his son. But he did inherit his father's wealth and considering he wasn't working in the military, he had time to indulge his curiosity. In his memoirs, there are fantastic paintings of exotic animals. There's a painting of a zebra that has a very funny story behind it. The zebra was being taken as a gift to the Shafavid Shah and it was traveling through the port of the empire. Jahangir heard about it and had it brought to court first and didn't believe that it was real. He thought that it was a painted horse, so he had people try and wash them off. Only when the paint didn't come off did he realize his mistake and ordered that the wondrous creature be painted. At number 4, Shah Jahan and the Taj Mahal. Okay, so this one isn't messed up for violence or anything, but it is the ultimate love story and we just can't leave it off this list. There is one part that is messed up to me because man, I don't even know, but we will get to that. If you've ever been to India, then one of the stops you made on your trips was probably to the Taj Mahal, a breathtaking mausoleum built by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan to commemorate the love of his life. Considering how big and intricate it is, you know that their love was bigger than any storybook. An Indian poet called the Taj Mahal a teardrop on the cheek of time, a testament to grief and power. Mumtaz Mahal was Shah Jahan's favorite wife, forsaking all of his other wives just to be with her. They went everywhere together, even on military missions. This is where, from my perspective, where things get crazy. This woman delivered 14 children for her husband. 14. Sadly, whilst giving birth to the last, she passed away, inspiring her king to build this massive structure. Both Shah Jahan and his love are buried beneath it. At number 3, Brothers at Odds. Shah Jahan's rule was considered the golden rule of the Mughal Empire, so how do you top that? Aurangzeb did not even bother trying, and he kinda sucked. He was Shah Jahan's third son, and he was a very military minded man, showing tactical and strategic military skill and unrivaled determination. Whereas his brother was a man of letters, and no, not the kind from Supernatural. Aurangzeb wanted power, and so in order to secure his rule, he confined his ailing father to his own palace, caused the death of one of his brothers, and had two more of his brothers, a son and a nephew, executed. He was literally committing fatricide left, right, and center. But it didn't matter to him because he gained control. Control. His desire to prematurely end the lives of those who stood in his way was described as, quote, a wolf thirsting for the blood of his brothers, end quote. He would think that this motivation to gain power and rule on his own terms would mean that he had big plans for the empire, which in a way is true, but those plans and changes led to a lot of oppression, but we will get to that in a bit. I number two, staked. Before we get into the oppression that Aurangzeb caused to his empire, let's talk about Emperor Farooq Siyar. Farooq Siyar was emperor of the Mughal Empire from 1713 to 1719. He was described as an incapable ruler who gave his power to all of his advisors. His rule caused many conspiracies and plots to arise within the court. He caused a lot of people a lot of pain for his plight for power. With the help of his allies, he gave many of his enemies the gift of the big sleep, but by far the most ruthless thing he did was kill Jahandar Shah and Zulkifakar Khan Nazrat Zung. What made their death so brutal was the fact that when they went eh, the emperor hung their heads on poles, and just to add insult to injury, he made their parents walk at their funeral. Luckily for the people of the Mughal Empire, Farooq Sahir was killed by unknown assailants at the instructions of his close relatives, putting an end to his awful reign. And finally, at number one, the Great Oppressor. Aurangzeb's rule sort of had two chapters to it. At first, Aurangzeb was a capable ruler of a mixed Muslim Hindu empire who was feared yet respected for his vigor and skill. But around 1680, Aurangzeb's rule changed drastically in both policy and attitude. His once unified people of both Muslims and Hindus broke apart, and people of Hindu faith became subordinates, not colleagues. On top of that, Aurangzeb added some more oppression to the mix and not only destroyed Hindu temples, but he also also reimposed the Giza tax on non-Muslims after the tax was initially banned by Emperor Akbar. 
For the first 20 years of Aurangzeb's rule, he did not impose a tax, but all of a sudden he started demanding these payments. And historians believe that Hindu uprisings are what caused the emperor to act harshly towards the non Muslim population. This discrimination caused a revolt to unfold that Aurangzeb's third son supported. Aurangzeb spent his last 50 years taking his aggressions out on the Hindus in the empire, and it's for this reason that he is remembered by many as a tyrant. Number 10 The Young Tsar. Being the leader of a nation is hard. I play a lot of city builders, trust me, I know. Being the leader of a nation whose people have been brutally oppressed by your family's dynasty for 300 years and in general living in very poor conditions, especially compared to the rest of the world, that's hard too. Even harder. Nicholas II inherited the throne from his father, which sounds great, but in reality was a lot of pressure to do so. As it turns out, Russia was in need of drastic change, and they would get it from the people and a bald man with very pointy facial hair. A communist revolution saw the empire of Russia fall. 300 years of Romanov rule end overnight as the Tsar was forced to abdicate his throne. So what's his crime? Well, not doing anything. Negligence. He did so much nothing that people had to do something. Number 9. Nero Steam We've talked about Emperor Nero quite a lot on this channel, but that's because he's the down bad Roman Emperor who puts opulence in Pax Romana. It's hard to pinpoint an exact crime or moment from him, as he's the guy you think about when you think of Roman Emperors. However, his crimes against his wife Claudia Octavia are very notable. So when Nero was getting remarried, he had to get rid of Octavia. I mean, you can't, you can't have like 40 wives, wait, that's, we gotta get rid of her. But how? I mean, how do you get rid of a woman like that? He actually did the whole uh, James Bond villain thing where the victim gets placed into a trap. Uh, it's very crude, but theatrical, because remember, that's, theatrics are important, remember that folks. Hence, Octavia was banished to an island where shortly after she was locked into a vapor bath, where she suffocated. Naturally, to make himself look better, uh, they made it look like uh, they made it look like she did it, not him. So yeah, what a great guy! What a what an absolute hero in that story. Definitely not a villain. Number eight, Abzal Khan. Everyone remembers King Henry VIII for doing what he did to his wives. A naughty slap on the wrist, naughty. Don't do that for shame. However, I would like to offer Abzal Khan as the alternative monster here. He, he didn't unalive a handful of wives like Henry. No, no. He actually managed to rack up a count of 63. Yep, you heard me right. 63. First off, I don't know how you have that many wives and or remember names, let alone birthdays and anniversaries. I would not do very well in that situation. Well, what's the reason for all this blood spilling? It's pretty horrible, actually. Simply because he was being invaded, and the guy who was invading him and winning was slightly nicer to women and was going to most likely give them a better life. Jeez, talk about if I can't have it, no one can. God. Number seven, Caligula's wife. I think in a healthy relationship, you ought to put your partner on a pedestal. Maybe your partner is drop dead gorgeous, a promising athlete, or really enjoys building Legos. Nice tie fighter, babe, way to go. Yeah. Emperor Caligula of Rome liked to put his wife on a pedestal, literally. And while on this pedestal, she was wearing nothing but her birthday suit. Oh boy. While all of his friends, politicians, generals got to gawk and stare at her, and in some weird goth power flex, he would oftentimes hold a knife to her and tell her that he could just end her life whatever he wanted because he can do that. Not to mention the guy had a complete narcissist complex, building statues of himself everywhere just so she can like, oh great, there he is again, it's him again. Number six, Kangas Khan. I bring the man up again because he's responsible for so much loss. So much blood spill, so much pain. Sure, they were effective warriors and archers, but they were, they were brutal, dude, especially him. They took what they wanted when they wanted, and it's said that he was responsible for so many lives lost that it affected the carbon footprint of the planet. Dude, that's insane. That is literally insane. Also, to note his treatment of rather uh, well, mistreatment of women, YouTube won't let me say much, but I can tell you that these ladies were not inviting him into their bedrooms. It wasn't, uh, wasn't good. As it stands today, because of his bedroom misconduct, his DNA still lives on. 5% of men worldwide share his DNA. Number 5. Pedro of Castile 
Pedro of Castile was doing as the European monarchs do. Sometimes you gotta marry for alliances. Sure, it makes sense. Your kingdom is much less likely to get steamrolled by a larger kingdom if you have an alliance with fellow kingdoms or the bigger kingdom itself, actually. Pedro of Castile married the young Blanche of Bourbon of France, and so Spain could just be a wee bit more snug you know, in case the English come over. You gotta be careful. But Pedro just wasn't having it. What he was having instead was a mistress named Maria. So instead of enduring a loveless marriage, he had poor Blanche locked away in a tower, just like Sleeping Beauty. Except a handsome prince was not coming to rescue this damsel in distress, uh, but a man with a black hood and a sharpened axe. You know what I'm talking about. As Pedro had her unalived. I was gonna make a joke about Rapunzel and let down some hair so she could make an escape, but I mean, that's just, that's just awful, really. Imagine being locked up in a tower for so long. Sure, I love the indoors, but you gotta let me out at some point, Chief. Do you think I get food delivery apps to work up in a tower? Because otherwise you have to let me out, dude. Comic Con's coming. Anime Convention North's coming, buddy. I gotta go. I gotta get, gotta get my Naruto on, bro. Come on, man. Number four, hands-on funeral. This one's just gross. When you're in a relationship, it can provide you with some great things. Someone to go through life with. Companionship. Love. And if you're lucky, someone who's a good cook or a baker. Oh, love me some baked goods. Mmm. However, also in a relationship, sometimes you do more than that. Sometimes you get a little close under the sheets, if you know what I'm saying. Take King Philip V, for an example, who loved loving his wife so much that, he, well, he just couldn't help himself, you know? Like, for instance, when his wife tragically passed away, he wanted one last, um, one last ride. But he penciled in one more trip to Toe Curl City before she was laid to rest. I, I just... God, it doesn't seem right, you know? That just let her, you know, let her, let her go peacefully, you know? Let her just, ah, f Number three, Lenin. Okay, while not a king in the most stereotypical sense, he did dethrone a king and made himself an autocratic dictator, which is basically a king just modern. Trust me, it is. It, yep, trust me. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, Lenin had been anti-royal for most of his life, but after some help from some sneaky Germans and other Soviets loyal to his cause, the Tsar had no choice but to abdicate. Like I said at the top of the list. He abolished the Tsar's secret police and then put in his own. Mm. And had people oppressed, which was one of the main reasons why the whole revolution started in the first place. See what I'm getting at? He was supposed to get rid of the evil monarch, and he became the evil monarch. Hmm. Well, see, then a civil war broke broke out and then he was worried that the exiled Tsar might escape and try to retake the throne and well he had some goons take care of him and uh, well the family too. You, you can never be too sure. You gotta take care of everything. You gotta get rid of everybody. You just can't be too sure. Number two. Pope John the 12th. For those who aren't very religious like myself, the Pope is the big one. He's next to God, and for a minute there, he was the most powerful man on earth. Seriously, I mean, this guy could crown kings. He's the king of the Vatican, and the king of kings in the Holy Scripture. It's kind of serious. And today, he's got a really cool car for parades. The Pope Mobile is pretty sick, I'm not gonna lie. However, Pope John the 12th was anything but a sweet old man who delivers the holy messages from God. This Pope was doing a lot of anti-Pope behavior, if you will. Now, I for one wouldn't care if the man had a girlfriend or a glass of wine. Heck, some rules need to be changed, but this Pope uh, was most known for his lavish, how you say, adult-themed parties, and was known for getting hangovers. It got so bad at one point, it started a war. Number one, not so slick shady. Marshall Mathers, Eminem, the king of rap and named king of hip hop by Rolling Stones magazine. Hence he's a king, I gotcha. Despite what you think of the man's lyrics, especially vulgarity, he's an excellent wordsmith and could write rhymes that would leave you tongue twisted. However, I don't think it would come to anyone's surprise that the man's got a few charges under his belt, especially the way he talks about Kim. There's a couple, a couple bad things said about her, I don't know. Back in 2001, arguably the peak of his career, Eminem assaulted somebody in a nightclub after getting fresh with his wife. He got two years probation. Hmm. Maybe, maybe, maybe he is saying the things he's saying in those songs. Maybe he's telling the truth. Hmm, I don't know. Number 10, King Charles I. You can put any king down on this list, really. Uh, people weren't as kind and loving as we are now. Or, or well... Less cruel, I guess. <laughs> King Charles was no different from any other. A monarch sniffing his own farts up in his castle, doing his very best to snuff out religious groups that he didn't agree with. A lot of guys were like that. It's brutal, but that's history, folks. Well, one such measure he took, I think, was so wrong, so heinous, and so criminal, and so offensive, that he should have been locked up for life. 
During the 1600s, this man, in an effort to curb religious views, outlawed Christmas. Yeah, that's right. Outlawed Christmas. That means no gifts, no tree, no Santa Claus, no turkey, no stuffing, no nothing. This was quickly dissolved after he was removed from office. And yes, I know Santa Claus wasn't there then, but st it's still, it's Santa Claus, it's Christmas. Can't have Christmas without Santa Claus. Number nine, William the Conqueror. You've all probably heard the name William the Conqueror. Battle of Hastings, illegitimate son of the king fighting for the throne, very violently too, I might add. However, today I want to talk about his dating skills. Look, dating can be hard. I, I, I get that. There's a lot of anxiety, especially when self-image comes into play. Ooh, I'm too fat. I hate my nose. And what are these legs? Ugh, no one's gonna like me. Everyone thinks like that. And it's always usually right before a date, too. You could be staring in the mirror, and then all of a sudden all your bruises, pimples, and blemishes seem to show up out of nowhere. It's weird how that works. Well, William was different though. He, he was more confident. He didn't have confidence issues like the rest of us. To, to quote a brilliant chemist, he was the one who knocks. As the story goes, he was quite fond of one lass. She was not fond of him. Classic story, really. So after trying to court her several times and failing, he decided to drag her on the ground by her hair until she said yes. Don't, don't do that, that's, that's bad. Number eight, Kangas Khan. I don't think some folks realize just how brutal this guy really was. I mean, if you've ever played the Ghost of Tsushima game on PlayStation, then you know exactly what the Mongol horde is capable of. Nasty things. The man carved out most of Asia and parts of Europe. In one battle allegedly, taking the lives of one million people. And all that remained was a mountain of bones and human fat. Ooh, gross. He's been known on how not to treat a lady and reportedly liked to use his young and newest soldiers as arrow fodder by creating human shields with them. A lot of conscripts in his army were often taken from villages that he conquered. It's kind of how he kept the machine going. So either fight with me or that's picture wrap for you. What a nice guy. What a swell nice guy. Jeez. Number seven, Galizo Maria Saforza. This guy was just bad. Like, like all bad. Not like Deadpool where he does some bad stuff for good reasons, anti-hero kind of guy. This, nah, this guy's just straight bad, straight evil. In one story of the disturbed king, he had a rival's hands chopped off. No more tennis matches. He left prisoners in hanging cages and even had a priest that made a prediction about him that he didn't find all too flattering in prison with little food and water. It got to the point where the man had to eat his own refuse. So, if you cross Galeazzo Maria Saforza, um, don't, don't do it. Number six, Ivan the Terrible. I'm not that familiar with Russian history before the year 1900, but there is a lot to unpack. It's not all Lenin and hammers and sickles and such. Ivan the Terrible was the first czar of Russia, and he was quite the specimen. From having struck his daughter-in-law and unlifing his son in a fit of rage, he was one nasty dude. However, I believe the story of him in St. Basil's Cathedral is more noteworthy. As the story goes, Ivan commissioned an architect to build St. Basil's Cathedral. If you've ever seen it, you know how gorgeous it is. All the Onion Palace buildings and whatnot, you know what I'm talking about. Ivan was so impressed with the architect's work that he had his eyes gouged out so that no one could ever build another structure or gaze upon another structure as magnificent as the cathedral. That's hardcore, dude. That's pretty hardcore. So if you do a bad job, he probably would have got rid of you. And if you do a good job, he'll still get rid of you. Number five, Ferdinand the First of Naples. This one is so strange, I I can't even, I, I have to mention, I, I cannot not say it. In a nutshell, Ferdinand looked normal, just your average European king. I mean, what, what could be wrong about this guy, right? He looks pretty normal. Well, the guy was basically Buffalo Bill. Ferdinand liked to keep his enemies close, taken after a little bit of Michael Corleone. However, so close that oftentimes dinner guests would mysteriously disappear and end up not breathing. Afterwards, they would be mummified and pickled and dressed as if they were still alive. He would then invite more guests over for dinner to show them what could happen if they crossed him. He would open the doors and show them a sick dinner-esque area play thing of people dressed up and that's 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 what bad people do that's what buffalo bill would do that's gross we don't like that number four henry the eighth are you even surprised he's on this list i mean come on it's henry the eighth 
But I, I support all healthy marriages and I support healthy divorces. Sometimes things just don't work out, but that doesn't mean you have to go all Johnny Depp on the situation. There's better ways to work things out. Well, in Henry's case, it may not be televised on national TV or global TV in this case. It was more like Edward Scissorhands, if you will. Henry VIII is famous for dealing with his wives. When the church would not grant him the divorce he so wished for, he removed his wife's head from her body. And then he remarried and divorced another, and then he, uh, well, another one lost her head and then divorced another, and then finally he passed away and the wife lived on. It makes sense, sure, that's, all I'm saying is the man went a little too far. That's all I'm saying, just a little bit. Number three, John King of England. This is the dude who wrote the Magna Carta, which for legal students everywhere is like planet Krypton. It's where it all starts. The whole Superman, the law, everything. It's the basis of everything. Besides Hammurabi's code, of course. Well, it's not like he signed it very enthusiastically, and the man really wasn't the nicest. He's also known for taking 22 of his most noble knights and throwing them away in a dungeon until they starved and didn't wake up for, well, no breakfast. He betrayed his brother, Richard the Lionheart, the very famous Richard the Lionheart, who also wasn't very nice either, and is suspected of being the mastermind behind the delifing of his nephew. Ooh, talk about family scandal. Number two, Napoleon Bonaparte. I know, hear me out though. The story of France and Napoleon is one for the history books. I mean, really, it's, it's so strange. Imagine a country that violently overthrows its king and queen, and then while in the middle of that, which could be described as the worst political strife in history, you then go to war, which, if you know how that, it's, it's not a good idea. You, 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 you're probably gonna lose. Except Napoleon didn't lose. Napoleon took France to war like five times within a, a short time period and won most of them. It's pretty good. Well, good for winning, not good for the people that didn't make it. That's when he declared himself Emperor of France and kind of lost his way, which it's stupid because it defeated the whole purpose and point of the revolution and the democracy that the people were so fighting for. Eventually, the international community caught up with him and banned him to an island twice because he came back and said, I'm back, and then, no, back to the island, go, go back, you're, go, you're going back. Number one, Elvis Presley. Look, I know, I know, it's, it's Elvis, but he's the king of rock and roll, man. You, you can't go wrong with Elvis. It, plus, it kind of works, too, because I think people have a really good image of him, but he actually wasn't, you'll see. He is the king of rock and roll, to be fair, and he's more famous than any king on this list, actually, but the king of rock and roll isn't so squeaky clean and certainly not a stranger to crime and scandal. At some points in his career, you could find him excessive drinking and using um, illicit substances, if you will. He might have had to put on those jailhouse rocking denims, well, for real. Back in 1956, at the peak of his fame, really, Elvis got into a physical altercation with two gas station attendants after fans began to crowd him, it was a messy situation, and he was actually up on charges of battery and disorderly conduct. Not a good look for the king, baby. The king's gotta stay clean. At number 10, Caligula. This guy reigned for four years, and the amount of straight up excess he demanded led him to be the first Roman emperor to be assassinated. Caligula was 25 years old when he took power in 37 AD, and he was great. He announced political reforms and recalled all exiles, but within the same year, he contracted an illness that sent him a little uh, loopy. Like to the degree of ordering hundreds of Roman merchant ships to form a two mile floating bridge across the Bay of Bowley so he could spend two days galloping back and forth across it on his horse, Incitatus. Oh, um, speaking of his horse, he loved that animal so much, giving him his own house with a marble stall and ivory manger. And he almost appointed the horse consul before Caligula met his end. It got worse in the years after his demise, like in 39 and 40 AD when he led campaigns to the Rhine and the English Channel, where he actually avoided battles and instead did things like commanding his troops to plunder the sea, which means gathering shells in their helmets. The perfectly sane kind of things that you do when your favorite quote is, remember that I have the right to do anything to anybody. Number nine, Ramses II. He literally has the most statues of himself of all the 4,000 years of Egyptian pharaohs. That is really all I gotta say, actually. Ramses II was undoubtedly the greatest pharaoh. I don't know if that justifies his spoiled ways, but it helps explain them at the very least. He was a master builder, a war hero, and brokered peace all around over his crazy long reign. 
but he was also really good at the whole propaganda thing. Like I said, he has statues of himself all over Egypt that even to this day are hard to avoid. Not to mention all the buildings built in his name, including a whole temple to himself and one to one of his wives, Nefertari. He moved the capital from Thebes to the new capital he created, named, unsurprisingly, Pi Ramses, from which he ruled for 67 years, had literally hundreds of children and dozens of wives. He also, kind of hilariously, renovated statues and temples erected by previous pharaohs with his tag either to pay respect or what I'm going to go with, just to say, look at this big statue of some other dude, but always remember, trademarked by Ramses the Great. P.S. I'm awesome. Number eight, William the Second. Usually being overshadowed by his father William the Conqueror and his successor Henry the First, William the Second wasn't a well-liked king, particularly by the church, because William kept positions for bishops empty so he could take their incomes, which made me laugh when I read it actually. The Archbishop of Canterbury Anselm really had an issue with William, even going into exile until William ceased to live. But this just left the revenues of the Archbishop of Canterbury vacant, making William able to claim those funds as well until the end of his reign. He obviously was not a fan of the church, but his armies definitely were a fan of him. He was great when it came to warfare and was able to pretty much guarantee loyalty by showing it. William didn't have any heirs or wives, which led people to question his preferences, if you know what I mean. He ultimately met his end at the tip of an arrow during a hunting accident, but he was always remembered for being ruthless and giving in to his vices. Number seven, Morad IV. Something about kings being great also goes hand in hand with them being terrible at the same time. 17th Sultan of the Ottoman throne, Murad IV, came to power in September 1623 at the age of 11. But since he was so young, the Ottomans were ruled by his mother, Kosim Sultan, and other relatives, who did a pretty horrendous job. As a tween, he walked around the cities dressed as a commoner and would keep a list of those he could benefit from and those he could punish at 11. At 21, he took control and also took some extreme precautions in order to eliminate the corruption within the empire, banning the use of alcohol and tobacco and coming up with severe measurements for the regular collection of taxes. Murad IV would never be okay with people disobeying his laws and directives, even going around the city in plain clothes to check any undisciplined actions by the locals, and he would personally punish the offenders. He did a lot for the Ottomans, but boy was he harsh about it. He destroyed coffee houses. Like, come on, man. Number six, Phalaris. Phalaris of Acragas was a tyrannical Sicilian ruler from around 571 to 554 BC. And this dude was so bad, his own people overthrew him after his 16 years of rule. Phalaris became ruler by some unconventional ways when it came to other kings on this list. Some think he started as a farmer who held office, and other more fun stories say he was appointed to build a temple, and instead of doing that, he took the money and built a fortress, allowing him to take power. He expanded the territory of Acragas from the south coast of Sicily all the way up to the north coast, but he was known much better for how gosh darn cruel he was. The most famous story would have to be the one of the brazen bull. An engineer was hired by Phalaris to create a new device for doing heinous things to his prisoners. The engineer presented him with a bronze bull. There was a door that could be opened to place a prisoner inside, then they would light a fire underneath, heating up the bull and causing the poor soul inside to thrash about and yell, making the bull seem alive. He then used it on the engineer. Thanks to the citizen's revolt though, he got to be the last victim of the bull. Looks like karma's a bull. <laughs> Number five, Louis XIV, King of France, the Sun King, the God given. Ruling from 1638 to 1715, Louis XIV was well known for his love of art, which was apparent in the royal palace of Versailles he created. His love of women for his multiple wives and many more mistresses, and the comparison of himself to God. Even taking up the sun as his symbol, being representative of Apollo, the sun god, and the literal reason we're all alive. A good symbol, honestly. The Palace of Versailles was used to host comedies, operas, and tragedies, and spectacular parties. 
His suite in the palace was made up of three apartments all for himself. The palace was big enough to hold his entire court so that none of them could really plot against him without him knowing. It also contained the Hall of Mirrors which was a 71 meter long room with 357 mirrors around 17 arches opposite the massive windows. Unlike most other kings on this list, Louis XIV was a fantastic ruler. He was an incredibly lavish one though, which equals spoiled in my mind. Number 4. Ivan the Terrible Ivan Tsar was a great military leader, pretty much setting up the Russian Empire. A great leader with an absolutely terrible temper. His rage filled outbursts just got worse and worse over the years of his rule from 1530 to 1584. One of these incidents even ending in the stab filled demise of his own son. He had a special force called the Oprichina who eliminated anybody he felt threatened him and he led this force to Novograd in 1572 resulting in the massacre of Novograd which gets him a firm place as one of the cruelest of Russian rulers. There is the even more popular story of him making that uh, peculiar looking castle in Moscow and then dispatching the man who designed it so no one else could have one. He is one of the most cruel, paranoid, bad tempered and greedy rulers in not just Russian history but history in general. Literally terrible. Number 3. Nero Another Roman emperor who was effectively insane. Hmm, Seems to be like a trend. Best known for his spicy parties, political delifings, persecution of Christians and love for music that led to the rumor that Nero played the fiddle while Rome burned during the great fire of 64 AD. Nero first became emperor at 17 and the first little bit of his rule saw him be responsible for the demise of multiple people including his mother and his newest wife Poppea in a casual outburst of rage. He was quite the artist singing and performing and encouraging others to take lessons and he held sport events all the time even taking part himself. Remember that fire I talked about? Well some people believe he may have started it himself in order to make a bigger palace. But if he did or didn't he blamed the Christians and punished them much more than necessary like dressing them in animal skins and having them torn apart by dogs or being burned to the afterlife in pyres that would light his own garden parties. Oh and he bankrupt the Roman treasury building the aforementioned palace where he held his ridiculous parties we talked about before with a 100 foot golden statue of himself. Nice. Number 2. Bad King John Kings be bad sometimes. But when it came to lechery, treachery and shocking acts of cruelty, the king who sealed the Magna Carta takes the cake. According to the historians at least. While known for the Magna Carta, he is also well known as the king involved in the stories of Robin Hood. But these being fairy tales, was he really that bad? No! He was much 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 worse. During the time that he ruled, most nobles who were captured in war were kept in not so bad confinement. John said no though. Like when he captured his own nephew who miraculously disappeared and about 22 knights who were sent to a castle to starve to the afterlife to stop their families from continuing to fight. He did the same thing to the wife and son of his former friend. If that weren't bad enough, when his brother who was king at the time was taken prisoner, he tried to seize the throne and he is famous for forcing himself on the wives and daughters of his own barons. As you may remember from Robin Hood, there was a monetary aspect to his horribleness as well. The taxes and fines he levied were to the point of extortion. I talked to Andrew who talked to the chief and he said, King John ain't it. Number 1. Henry VIII Ah, Here we are, the main man himself. We've talked about him before and how could we not? He's arguably one of the most infamous English kings. Historians have described him as obsessive, syphilitic and a self indulgent wife delifer and tyrant. These historians probably leave the best Google reviews. It's not just his whole multiple wives to find a male heir situation that makes him spoiled. Well, kind of it is. To achieve his personal ends, he literally spurred on a religious revolution that created the Church of England, the formal end of monasteries and the Reformation. Which is hilarious because he wrote a treatise against Martin Luther that had him named defender of the faith by the Pope. Ironic. He, like many of the others, was a lover of art, music and sports, at least in his younger years. But he was also an incredibly costly ruler. While he unified much of England with Wales and Ireland, in 1520 with King Francis I of France, Henry co-hosted the Field of the Cloth of Gold, which was incredibly lavish and showed off his immaturity. Speaking of immaturity, there are tons of cases where people were separated from their heads simply for not giving him what he wanted including some of his friends and his wives. 
A great number one for this list, in my opinion. Number 10, King Midas. Most people know the story of King Midas, but in a nutshell, he was a king who was granted the power of the everything he touched turns to solid gold. So, no, he didn't exactly buy anything with that kind of power, but the man can have anything he wants or buy anything he wants. It's a lot of gold. This sounds great, but it's really awful for a couple of reasons. One, that is pretty much the moral of the story, and the other is, well, some basic uh, economy stuff. The first reason this would suck is that one, you should never be too greedy, and you really shouldn't. And you should always be careful what you wish for. This blessing quickly turned into a curse as Midas could no longer eat. Which, that's bad. Not eating and everything touched turn of gold. Oh, you can hug anybody, it's terrible. The other issue would be his wealth. You'd have to be very careful on how many items you actually touched, as producing too much gold would eventually devalue the price of gold. Especially if you touch a bed or something, that, that's, that's a lot of gold. Imagine how much a solid gold bed would weigh, or how much that would be worth. So in reality, you would be both starving and poor. Number nine, Mansa Musa. Sort of related to the King Midas issue, Mansa Musa was probably the richest man to ever walk the face of the earth. A king from Northern Africa who exploited his country's salt and gold reserves. His estimated wealth today would be around the $400 billion mark. $400 billion US, ooh, that's a lot of money. Tough to actually measure it exactly because it was from so long ago, but it could be less, and some say it could actually even be more. Mansa Musa went on tour one year to see all the beautiful things he could of the ancient world, and you can't take a little vacation without buying something at the gift shop. Mansa Musa was so rich and spent so much money in a few towns that he visited that he single-handedly upset the economy of those cities. Elon Musk wishes he could. So he basically bought a lot of stuff, and it was unusual because it upset the economy. Like, he destroyed the economy of those downs. That's insane. Number eight, Michael Jackson, the king of pop. Ah, see, I got you. I pulled a sneaky on you. But yeah, he's still a king. And maybe he was the biggest celebrity who ever lived. Would Halloween really be Halloween without Thriller? And how could cool guys let you know they were cool in the 80s if they didn't have all that leather jacket and stuff? You wouldn't be able to know. You just wouldn't. Well, maybe some things you don't know about Michael Jackson were his shopping habits. The man loved shopping. And with that kind of money, well, you can do anything. Well, some may remember his chimp, his Neverland Mansion, complete with carnival rides and arcade, and even an oxygen chamber in case Darth Vader was coming over to stay the night. However, something very strange the man tried to do was he tried to buy a very strange man himself, or rather his bones. For some reason, Michael had a fascination with the Elephant Man, a man with severe facial deformities and freak show performer from the late 1800s. Michael tried to purchase his remains. That's it. That's the point. He tried to buy him. They wouldn't let him, but he tried. That's a weird thing to buy. I've never, when I, whenever I hit the number, I don't go, hey, 1-800-Museum people, someone bring me King Tot. I want it. Number seven, Elvis Presley. Lots of similarities today. Elvis Presley, before Michael Jackson, he was probably the most famous person to ever exist. The king of rock and roll, baby, that's right. All I'll say is phone your grandma and ask her how she feels about him. She probably says she loves his music and those gyrating hips. At the time, it was pretty controversial. Boy, only if they knew what was going on today. Whew. Sorry, 50s Atomic families. Well, being that Elvis Presley was the king and the first celebrity to be idolized the way we do with modern celebrities, he became quite wealthy. Well, with all that money, he bought some weird things, including a chimp. Everyone's buying a monkey. They want a zoo. I don't know. A mansion property he named Graceland, a pink Cadillac for his mother, and strangely enough, he bought FDR's yacht. Yeah, what? That's so weird. Good president, sure, but does it really have room for a monkey in a pink Cadillac? I don't know. Number six, French royalty. This one is more about Marie Antoinette and King Louis XVI. It's kind of like a two-pack, kind of like a couple, but trust me, it all makes sense in the end. Uh, but it, again, and anything they bought, it was probably the king's wallet, wasn't it? Okay, so when your country is starving, demanding more rights, and in general, life really sucks, what's the next best thing you do? Buy a $12 million necklace. Yeah, right, okay, I've said that before, sure. Okay, Chad, what else? Continue to live your opulent life on the kings and people's dimes. Sure, why not? It makes sense, okay. I'm talking too much. Well, something I learned today and something that Taylor showed me is that I guess the last Queen of France was a little lonely. So what did King Louis do to fix this? Spend more time with her? Nay. Buy her a new dog? Nay, sir and madams. He had her pug from Austria imported to the country. And anyone can tell you that when something is imported, you are going to be dishing out a few more dosh. Yes, that's right. They imported her pug from Austria. Imagine how that sounds when your house is literally falling apart, you're 
starving and you pay the most taxes. Makes you want to put heads on pikes. That's what it makes you want to do. Can you imagine that? We're all poor and hungry. She's like, well, look at my dog. It's my dog. They're French, they don't sound like that, but this is my dog, look at my dog, here he is. <laughs> Number five, King of Egypt. His Majesty Farouk I, by the grace of God, King of Egypt and the Sudan, that was his full title, was disposed during his nation's 1952 revolution and spent the remainder of his days in exile to Italy. In his haste to avoid getting the Mussolini treatment, he left behind a majority of his most prized possessions. When the people got a look at what he was uh, storing behind the walls of his residence, they were a bit disgusted to find an excessive number of expensive suits, rare stamps and coins, jewels, luxury vehicles and many other things that I will never afford. Now, what else would he have that would be considered strange? I'll let you take a guess. Was it A, a blam blam cache? B, piles and piles of a white substance that made the 80s fun? Or C, an unsettling amount of gardening magazines? Go ahead and let us know in the comments below. I'll give you a second. Mm -hmm. Do, 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 do. Nope, time's up. If you said secret option D, you'd be right. What was it, you ask? Well, it was a disturbing amount of adult entertainment. So much so, it wouldn't even fit underneath his mattress. Man, that's, that's a lot. That's too much. That's too much. Number four, Peter the Third. Remember the last time you played with your toys as a kid? The same. And let us know what your favorite toys were as a kid. Let's see if we have some shared favorites. I'm actually curious. That's kind of a cool thing to talk about. Well, for Peter the Third, it was little army men, or tin soldiers, I guess you'd call them. And yes, he played with them as an adult, staging mock battles. Is it the weirdest thing ever? No, it's not. But he was a king, so that's a wee bit strange. Hey, I love army men just as much as the next guy, especially those little green plastic dudes. I used to love those video games too. Very underrated in my opinion. I love that stuff. It also makes me think of that scene in Spaceballs. Enough references aside, you never really know someone until you've seen the money they've spent on their army men collection. Number three, Ibrahim the First. Fur, fur everywhere. Abram I of the Ottoman Empire was the 18th Sultan and the number one purchaser of fine furs. Personally, I've never had any fine furs. I grew up in the trailer park and Mama always said that fur was cruel anyway, so I never felt the luxury of uh, fine furs, if you will. It must be nice because Ibram loved them so much. Like, he really, really loved them. His whole wardrobe consisted of them, in fact. Plus, his walls were covered in them, and apparently even his curtains. I don't do well in heat, so I'll pass on that. I'd be sweating way too much. Too much fur. Number two, the locksmith. Who are you and how'd you get in here? I'm the locksmith and uh, I'm the locksmith. Classic Leslie Nielsen. God, I love that guy. I love those movies. I'd love to make one one day. We're starring one. Hollywood, call me. King Louis XVI, the last king of France. We're back to him again. The man spent his time and money on something rather strange. No, not all was spent on his wife and her life. And yeah, I'm kind of putting him on the list twice, but trust me, it's weird. I mean, come on. He gave the queen whatever the heck she wanted. Well, apparently he loved to spend his time and money on locksmithing. What? Yeah, that's so weird. He would spend his time trying to get into locks and understand them. He was also stated as saying that every man should have a passion. Hey, maybe put down the locks and start helping the people as a passion. There's an idea. What a great idea. Feed the people. Instead, I'm just going to work on this lock. I'm just going to go ahead and just, yeah, almost got it. Yep. Number one, Christian the Seventh of Denmark. I saw this and I just, I just had to put it on here. I mean, come on. Apparently, the guy wasn't very mentally stable. I mean, who is these days? Apparently, the royal spent a lot of his time uh, waxing his carrot, polishing the flagpole, tenderizing the gabagoo, charming the snake, uh, self-firing in all cylinders, the one-handed bedroom dance. Uh, what I did all summer long in high school. You get the point, okay? You understand what I'm trying to say. Truth of the matter is, you don't get there with a little help from Vaseline or St. Ives. The man bought time so he could be this way. The man is either a legend or a crazy person. Imagine having that much money and that much time in your day that that's all you do.